Hiya, thanks for joining me again in another history video where we play Roots of Patcher by Soda Den and Crytivo. Hopefully the interesting history facts will distract you guys from the fact that I'm actually constantly getting lost in the games I play, but we'll see. So today I decided to take a look at the Celtic Britons. I did think a while about what my first official topic within England would be, and um, I decided that it would be best picking the Celts because they were such a large part of the British Isles originally. They actually inhabited the Isles from at least an Iron Age into the Middle Ages where they became the different groups that we see in the United Kingdom today. The early Celts rarely wrote about themselves. To the Greeks they were known as Keltoi, Keltai or Galatai and to the Romans Kelti, Kelte and Galli. We have the first mention of the Celts made by Greek authors between 540 and 424 BC. So we actually have the majority of our knowledge of them thanks to the Roman authors. As the Romans were actually expanding their borders, they came into contact with the Celts in their northern borders. But these texts and records are actually very incomplete since they were copied long after the events actually took place. So any information we have from this front is at best a very small piece of Celtic society. We don't actually even know what the Celts called themselves. The Celts is a modern name which is used to describe many tribes of people who lived during the Iron Age. None of the classical texts even refer to the people of Britain or Ireland as Celts because the Celts were just a collection of tribes. They were generally more known by the names of their individual tribes or societies rather than as a collective nation or empire. We have early records that place the Celts in Western Europe and also occupying land near the start of the Danube River. Their territories have often been traced to what is today central and eastern France extending across southern Germany and into the Czech Republic. In 279 BC, the Celts were known to have looted Delphi, a famous sacred Greek site. We also have a recorded meeting between the Celts and Alexander the Great in 335 BC in the Balkans. Historically, there is also a recorded large-scale migration of Celts soon after the 400 BC, where they ended up travelling from Central Europe into Northern Italy and Eastern Europe. But where does this leave us with the Celtic Britons? Well, it's a bit of a complicated question because we know that the Celts arrived at the shores of Britain at approximately 1000 BC and that they lived here during the Iron Age, the Roman Age and the post-Roman era. We also know 23 of the major tribes that lived across the Isles but no one can really agree on where they came from. Some people think they came from Gaul, which would make sense. Um, other people also think they come from the Central Europe cultures, like the Hallstatt. But across the Isles, the major tribes that we do know are, and I, <laughs> I have been practicing this because there is a lot of them, and I may not pronounce them correctly, but here we go. So we have the Atrobates, the Brigantes, the Canti, the Cavati, the Catuwalani, the Coriotawi, the Kornawawi, the Damnonai, the Deccan Angli, the, the Demeter, the Dubuni, the Dumnonai, the Durotrigus, the Ikeni, the Novanti, the Ordoicus, the Parisi, the Regni, the Selgove, the Silores, the Texto Verdi, the Trinovantes, and the Vo Tadini. And as you can imagine, that was a mouthful, but here we go. So, um, one thing that I'm actually really, really keen on is not only history and aspects of things like genealogy but also the 
genetics and the makeup that make up makeup makeup um the parts of cultures and people so with mod modern archaeo archaeogenetics if i get my words out um unc they've actually uncovered a migration into southern britain during the bronze age over a, a 500 year period from about 1300 bc to 800 bc and these migrants were actually genetically most similar to individuals found also in France um, and had higher levels of early European farmer ancestry. So where you have the European hunters, you also had the farmers. So from 1000 to 875 BC, the genetic marker swiftly spread through southern Britain, making up half of the Iron Age people in the area but most importantly, not found in Northern Britain. So going back to the more sort of recorded parts of what we know about the Celts though, was, well, like I said, historical sources about the Celts aren't um, very numerous or, or anything like that. They're actually pretty limited. But from what we do have, we can get a pretty good idea of Celtic culture and society, having the image of what society may have looked at at the time, and getting a, a, a more full or better understanding of who the Celts actually were. So for instance, we have sources that show us that the pre-Christian Iron Age Celtic society was actually structured around class and kingship we have evidence that suggests that Celtic society was split up into different tribes, each of which was led by its own king. Some historians actually argue as well that later on in the Celtic period, the, the areas of society that had close contact with Rome actually adopted an oligarchical republican reformer government. So instead of being dictated by a king or you know, that sort of ruler, they actually had a small designated group of people within society, like a, like a board of directors or a parliament. We also know that their society was generally divided into three main groups. So you had the warrior aristocracy, you had, um, which, you know, sounds pretty self-explanatory, you had the intellectual class. This was a class of people like druids, poets, jurists, who even, you know, laid down the law. And then you had everyone else. The offices of both high and low kings in Celtic times were often decided through an election under a tanistry system. So a tanistry system was a custom along um, a lot of tribal groups, mostly prominent in Scotland and Ireland actually, where kings and chiefs were elected. It wasn't a case of inheriting the, the tribe. This system was eventually overthrown when the feudal system came into effect, where the firstborn son in the family would become the successor rather than someone who they actually thought could rule. Now, something that is quite widespread across the entire world in history is the role that enslavement has played in different cultures. It's usually agreed enslavement practiced by the Celts was similar to what was being practiced in ancient Greek and Roman societies at the time. So they would have acquired their enslaved people from war, raids, and they also had slaves that came from punitive and debt servitude. Enslavement was also hereditary, so if your parents were both slaves, you would also be born as a, a slave yourself as part of your caste. It was possible for enslaved people to actually be relieved from them in, in rare cases, but it was generally discouraged by law because they viewed it as a potentially dangerous idea um, for slaves to be released in case of revenge and, you know, things like that. 
But looking again at the recordings by Roman authors, the Celts were described as wearing brightly coloured clothes, with some having used blue dye from the woad plant to paint patterns on their bodies. Having grown up in the UK myself, I've never seen woad. Um, it's not it's not generally called woad now. It has another name, but I've never I've never seen it in person. I might try to grow some. Maybe I'll paint myself blue. But they are known for their colourful wool clothing. And later on, some tribes obviously took up the Scottish tartan as well. The clothes the Celts would wear showed status and importance within the tribe. The usual Celtic attire would include a tunic and a belt, as well as a long cloak and trousers, which were fastened with a fibula. Many historians have noted that Celts were actually the first people in Europe to wear trousers. Let that sink in there. We were the first ones with trousers. So another aspect of societies is language. Um, there is a lot of languages that all stem from Celtic culture. Some of these languages still survive today, such as Welsh or Camaraig, which is still spoken by nearly a million people worldwide. Other languages survived, but there are fewer speakers. Um, Cornish language is actually made a comeback. It's considered a revived language because it, it did actually go extinct, it, but it has come back and it's called Canuwak. Of course you've got the Gaelic languages as well, so you've got Scottish Gaelic, which is the na native language of Scotland, still spoken by people there today. You also had Pictish, which is considered um, now a common language from Britonic as well, whereas originally People didn't think this was the case, but we now know it does share the same roots. You have got other Celtic languages as well that are still spoken today, like Manx, which is from the Isle of Man, and then Breton, a Celtic language spoken in Brittany in modern day France. Because the ancient Celts didn't have a writing system until much later in the timeline, we know that their religion is mostly gleaned from the archaeology that we've managed to do surrounding them. Greek Roman accounts, a lot of it sort of misguided or hostile, and literature from the early Christian period. We know that Celtic paganism was one of the larger Iron Age polytheistic religions of Europe. It varied by region, by time, um, generally the same sort of ideas were followed among the Celtic people, but it could vary quite widely from tribe to tribe. So, the names of over 200 Celtic deities have actually survived. Some of these were, they could have been alternative names, regional names, or titles for the same deity. Um, some deities were actually worshipped only in one region, where others were known from tribe to tribe and were more well known. One that I think a majority of people from today would recognise from a certain game, we won't name names, um, is the horse and fertility goddess Epona. After the Roman Empire's conquest into southern Britain though, the Celtic religion there underwent a lot of Romanization. so it resulted in a, a Gallo-Roman religion with deities being combined from both cultures. They were very good at taking cultures and gods that weren't their own and incorporating it into their own religion. The Celts did gradually convert to Christianity from about the 3rd century onward. After the end of Roman rule in Britain, Celtic paganism began to be replaced by Anglo-Saxon paganism. And then over to what became England eventually. The Celtic populations of Britain and Ireland gradually converted into Christianity from the 5th century onward, but Celtic paganism never really left. Um, it left a huge legacy in a lot of the Celtic nations, influenced mythology, and even now is it's been the basis for a new religious movement for Celtic neo-paganism. I feel like that was probably a lot to unpack in quite a short video, like you could you could go on talking about loads of different elements of the cultic culture, 
and I I do definitely want to. I want to have a, a a lot of insight into the different tribes because they were all very different. They they had different aspects to them. They've got different important people in each tribe. Um, one that you know I think is very well known is uh, Bodicea or Boudica as she's also known. I think everyone at some point has heard of her and the wars that she raised against like the Romans so you know I definitely want to look at the different aspects of each tribes and I think that's where I will probably take my next video but you know let me know what you think in the comments below share like and subscribe tell me where you want to go tell me what you want to listen to what sort of is there an aspect of like um something in celtic society that you want more of an insight into or is there a particular place in english history that you want me to cover or person let me know and you know I'm more than happy to have a look so Thank you for joining me today. It's been great having you all here and talking about something that I genuinely just really love. So thanks for stopping by. You take care. Bye.